Oh, wondering what this means? The highest amount of acceleration that any human has voluntarily undergone is 46.2 Gs. 46.2 times the acceleration due to gravity on Earth's surface, which is 9.81 meters per second per second. This was pulled by Air Force flight surgeon John Paul Stamp. And what he did is strap himself to a rocket sled to test the effects of speeding up and slowing down very, very quickly. When he pulled this 46 G's, he was strapped to a rocket sled facing forwards, going a thousand kilometers per hour. And to pull that, he went from a thousand kilometers to, per hour to zero in just a single second which led to this amount of deceleration. And in that single second, his body went from feeling its own weight to feeling like it was 7,000 pounds. Because he was facing forward, when he stopped, he felt as though his eyes would keep going, felt as though the eyes would pop out of his head. This is why this deceleration in this direction is called eyeballs out and he was feeling 7,000 pounds of eyeballs out force. His eyeballs did not pop out of his skull, but he was temporarily blind because of this feat, and all the blood vessels were broken in his eyes, and he looked like a red-eyed monster. But he lived to a ripe old age in his 80s and was more or less fine. And for this moment, he was, at the time, the fastest man on Earth. Altogether, pretty cool. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, where I take all of your nerdy questions live and try to answer them off the top of my head, hopefully related to all of the nerdery that we get up uh, to on this channel. The last episode was a... Yeah, the last episode was about super speed. That's right. But I will answer anything, or I will attempt to, and we're going to do it live, starting right now. Nate, what do we got? Sir M. Chops says, I got a question for Kyle. Oh, Sir Chops, you ask good questions. How much would a Death Star affect a planet, say Earth, gravitationally, if we were orbiting it? Hmm. Well, I think I've gotten this question before on a live stream, but what I will say is that uh, the Death Star, though it can be confused for a moon, if it were constructed like a space station might be constructed, even though this might be kilometers in radius, which I, I, I believe the Death Star is, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, a space station wouldn't be solid all of the way through. In fact, because it's in space and not under its, it doesn't have the, the, the force of its own weight acting upon it, if it's not near any significant gravity wells, then it can be more or less hollow. And it doesn't need the structural support that an object on Earth would need, like a skyscraper. So the Death Star could be mostly hollow. In fact, you'd probably want to to save money and, and time, etc. So without as much mass as a solid moon object, it would influence the Earth even less gravitationally uh, than our moon would. Now our moon does uh, provide quite a bit of force. Uh, it does generate force on our planet, and that force looks like a force acting to squish out the sides like this. And we call that the tidal force. That's why we get tides. There's bulges on each side of the planet. I go more into this in a future episode. But it's not all that much, so to speak. This, this only happens because we have a lot of surface that is water, and if you add up all the little gravitational effects over that large surface, you get something that's noticeable, the tides. Even if the Death Star was the size of our moon, it's probably much, much, much less massive, so it will probably have less effect on our planet than the moon would. So, altogether, not all that much. Next question. Jake DiBiaso says, I'm wondering, what is the most scientifically accurate science fiction film ever known? Huh, that is very hard to say. Um, what most, I'm not a working scientist, but what a lot of working scientists will say is uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. 
Aside from being a beautiful art film, it is very painstakingly recreating what you actually need to do in space. Uh, one of the more famous images is the astronaut running upside down in the circle to, uh, because there is, uh, that's one way to generate artificial gravity. If you have a torus, if you have a ring that is accelerating you towards the center, you feel a, a pseudo force pushing you out to the ground, which feels like artificial weight. That was very accurate. Uh, films like Interstellar do that as well. Uh, Interstellar comes close, now that I think about it, because uh, the advisor on the film, Kip Thorne, he just won a Nobel Prize uh, for gravitational waves. He's the kind of guy who won bets against Stephen Hawking. No, seriously. So he provided the equations for what the black hole would look like in Interstellar, Gargantua. And because scientists normally don't get to use incredibly high-end visual effects equipment, they're not in the movie industry, but for this movie uh, specifically, they took Kip Thorne's equations and put them through a Hollywood Christopher Nolan a visual effects suite, and the visual effects were so good that they were the most visually accurate uh, depiction of a black hole that anyone has ever seen, more or less, you know, in publicly. And it was so accurate, in fact, using those equations and the VFX work, that they published a paper on it. They published a real scientific paper on black holes just from the film Interstellar. I don't know if any other science film, uh, any other sci-fi film can say that it's accurate enough that you could publish papers on it. So, you know what? You know what? <laughs> Let's go with Interstellar. <laughs> it's, it's 2018. Time for new stuff. What's next? D Sun says, what would happen if a sci-fi alien ship was the size of our solar system? What? Uh, I, I don't know. Where would they get all the material? I think maybe what you're getting at is a cool concept in science fiction uh, called a Dyson Sphere. So if you have a sun at the middle of a solar system, one uh, way that a very advanced civil civilization could get a massive amount of energy is to build a structure around that sun. And then so all a, a spherical structure, a sphere, around that structure that would capture every single ray of light, every single photon and all of its energy emitted from that sun. And then that could be harnessed as electricity or whatever. Um, that would be, I, I think that's the most popular massive scale alien structure. Something that is so big, it is a sphere around an entire star. That would be really cool. Uh, and it could power maybe interstellar travel. Hey, interstellar. What's next? Connor Freeman asks, if the Flash... Oh, hello, Mr. Freeman. If the Flash pulled a string on a Beyblade as fast as he could, what, what would happen? <laughs> what? The Beyblade question? Um, uh, I have a lame answer uh, and a cool answer. Uh, a Beyblade, because it is a top, if you were to spin it at flash speed, it would destroy itself. The RPM would overcome the material strength of the Beyblade. <laughs> so silly. Overcome the material strength of the Beyblade and it would rip itself apart. You may have seen videos where they take fidget spinners, kind of the same thing, and they spin them as fast as they can using like a compressed air or something like that, and eventually they will rip themselves apart. CDs will rip themselves apart at a certain RPM. Um, so that's what would happen to a Beyblade. But if the Beyblade were indestructible, oh, I don't know. I don't know, that sounds really complicated. Either it's going into the ground, or because it doesn't weigh a lot, it's flying. Something weird would happen, but I'd have to look into it. Next question. Uh, Tarji Tart says, how much, does from radi how much does radiation from humans affect the Earth's temperature, if at all? Uh, I, radiation from humans, I'm gonna assume you mean nuclear power plants or something like that? Um, almost nothing, probably equates to zero. Uh, the Earth gets its heat from the movement of its core and radioactive, radioactive materials in the Earth's uh, material itself that are uh, emitting, emitting uh, different kinds of radiation. And as that radiation slams into other particles next to it, it heats it up with its kinetic energy and it gets hotter. That's where the heat in the center of something like the Earth or another planet uh, comes from, or so we think. We can't even get down there. We can't even drill like a kilometer, uh, a few kilometers down into the crust. So uh, there's still a lot of 
-hmm. There's still a lot of unanswered questions on that front. Um, so how much do, does human radiation uh, add to the heat of the Earth? Not much. Unless you interpret this a little bit differently and say, uh, humans have put out so much carbon dioxide that radiation from the sun is being trapped more than it is escaping from the surface of the Earth, and that leads to global warming. So, in that interpretation of your question, human-induced uh, human radiation capture is affecting the planet in, in a temperature aspect more so than any other source we have seen in millennia. And it's a huge problem. <laughs> Next question. Innocence oh, asked. It's such a big problem. Someone, one of you nerds, come on, you can, you can help us figure it out. I know you can. What's next? Innocence asks, underground societies are common in fantasy and sci-fi. How realistic are they? Oxygen doesn't sink like CO2. Will they just be suffocate before long? Undersea societies? Underground, sorry. Underground Un societies. Underground societies. Hmm. I don't really, I don't see the problem with underground societies as long as they had a good ventilation system. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 no, yeah, um, termites have figured this out. <laughs> termites uh, live in giant chambers underground. If you want to look up some really cool YouTube videos, um, you can see that underground there are these gigantic chambers that stretch out so much further than you think and uh, you can find these structures by pouring liquid metal down there obliterating their society and then digging it up after it cools and you can see it I mean it is kind of terrible but you can see it anyway termites have figured out ways to engineer their structures in such a way that it creates its own ventilation system uh, specifically with their giant mound towers that you'll find, uh, that you'll find dotting grasslands and, and such, uh, they can engineer them in such a way that the airflow is self-generating. It's so cool. It, it, uh, architects are even looking into it, designs like this as a form of biomimicry for our own uh, skyscrapers because nature figured it out. But then again, nature had billions of years of trial and error, and we've only had a couple hundred thousand. I mean, not as, as us, not as peeps, peoples. What's next? Jacob Hicks asks, how would, how would our galaxy be affected if another sun showed up? Our galaxy? Did you say galaxy? I yeah, think, I think the estimation for how many stars are in our galaxy, in our galaxy, are a hundred Billion. So, that is a still effectively a hundred billion. So, not much. I think you mean, you probably mean our solar system. And uh, if another star was added to our solar system, depending on where it is, it could uh, destroy everything, uh, at least us. Or, you could set it up in such a way, most stars that you see in the night sky are uh, multiple star systems with stars orbiting each other around a common center of mass. So they're kind of center of gravity, rather, sorry. So they're orbiting each other. So most stars are like two stars spinning around each other. So most stars in the night sky, if they have planets, uh, from those planets are Tatooine. Most of them in the night sky. So if you're, uh, what, I, what I mean to say is, is that if it's set up in the right way, you add another sun to, the solar system, to a solar system and it could be totally fine. You just have to be, be far enough away from both and you can still sustain life, like Tatooine. Or Dantooine. What a lame, what a lame, I don't know, we already said Tatooine. I don't, come up with another planet. I don't know, Craig Tween? No, 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 something else. Dan to sure, fine, put it in there. See, I told you she could be reasonable. That's a Tarkin. What's next? Ghostfighter Gaming asks, Ooh. 
Do you think Kitty Pride Shadow Cat could face through a lightsaber? Thanks. What? Uh. <sighs> That's such a hard question. <laughs> um, I don't know. It would depend on whether or not Kitty Pride touches the surfaces that she phases through. If she could extend her, so my interpretation of how her powers work is extending the wave function of her body. So if she has a she has a quantum mechanical wave function to her body, she can extend the probability that she would be found on some other side of a barrier or something like that. This is what I think Dr. Manhattan is also probably doing. He's extending, he, he's increasing the probability that if you look for him on Mars, you will find him on Mars. And in that respect, he teleports to Mars. So, if Kitty Pride was on, if Kitty Pride was on one side of a lightsaber and she extended her wave function toward, uh, on the opposite side and then was just found there, then uh, she'd be fine. But if she touched the lightsaber and moved through its material, then she wouldn't be fine. Because at this distance, let's just say here, let's just consider this is a real lightsaber. <laughs> and I'm this close to it. Uh, this would feel as hot as the sun would at its surface. So she'd be dead. What's next? Uh, There's no music going on. I'm just, you know, beeping and popping. Refenix 2 asks, what would the after effects when Yellowstone volcano erupts? Oh, um, the mega volcano, Super Caldera? The Super Caldera, which is kind of like a, a boiling cauldron of lava underneath Yellowstone, if that were to erupt, I may be wrong, but the last thing I read about it is that it might be an, ex an extinction level event. Meaning us. Be bad. There's actually a really, my, my favorite game last year was Horizon Zero Dawn on PS4. And it was fantastic. And it was, the gameplay is so good. And it's beautiful. Anyway, in the, uh, in the DLC for that game, there's actually, okay, cover your ears if you don't want spoilers for the DLC of Horizon Zero Dawn, a game that's been out for a year. All right. They have such a cool concept for power generation. In the future, they, they, uh, they rig up a hydroelectric power plant to dump water on the Yellowstone caldera so that it is constantly not getting hot enough to erupt or not getting uh, filled enough or whatever the critical uh, point is. So they're pouring water on it to keep it under control to create steam, to create a power source that would last for thousands of years. It's such a cool idea. And it's in a video game. That's why I like video games. What's next? From Dustin Berkeley, did you enjoy how well the latest episode from The Expanse yes. demonstrated the physics of changing angles by yes. maintaining the velocity during space flight? It was so good. Oh, man. Last episode of The Expanse, it's called IFF, uh, Identify Friend Foe. But it's, uh, it's season three, episode two of The Expanse. And they show if you're in a spaceship, if you're not accelerating, you are continuing on at a constant velocity, but then uh, what a really cool racing spaceship does is that once you want to change direction, the seats first realign themselves so that your back will be perpendicular to the, to the thrust so that when you do accelerate again, you are still feeling the same kind of weight. And if you, you can change direction and be weightless, and then you only have weight once you re-accelerate again. It's an action scene in The Expanse, and it's so well done. And it's my favorite show on TV right now. And if you want to see anything, if you want to know what, not the most accurate scientifically movie is, but the most scientifically, scientifically accurate show on television right now is The Expanse. Go watch it. I moderated their panel about the science at WonderCon. I, I love all of them. The actors are great. The uh, executive producer is a PhD. He was the science advisor on Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, can't say, can't say enough good things. I, I love that show. What's next? John Monroe asks, how does a moisture evaporator similar to those in Star Wars work? Mm. I made that sound because I know the answer, but I, I don't remember if I remember all of it. Um, moisture evaporators could work like ionic breezes. You remember those things? So if you have a, let's just say you have a rod like this. Now if you create an electric field, a small electric field around this rod, you can create airflow around it because charged particles, um, uh, particles are being charged around the rod 
and the rod would have the opposite charge to the charge that, that it is inducing, and this creates uh, airflow as particles are pulled and pushed away from said rod. Now, if that, uh, if that air that is moving past the rod has uh, moisture in it, what you can do is super cool the rod to induce condensation on the rod, which could be connected at the bottom or inside of it or whatever. So yeah, moisture evaporators are totally a thing and you would use them in the desert. Uh, in cool thing is that, <laughs> I've had too much coffee. Cool thing is that in the deserts of somewhere, <laughs> there are uh, cacti that grow in the desert that act just like moisture evaporators. So with them and their, and their prickly little, little prickle boys, little prickly spines here, because they just have the right uh, uh, density of material, there's just enough material in the air, fog rolls through the desert near the sea. And then moisture condenses on these cacti, which feeds the cacti and, and, and waters them. And the cacti do such a good job of evaporating like this that creatures come and drink. These are kind of like watering holes for them because there's no, there's no nearby source of water. So they come and drink on the cactus, which is a moisture evaporator IRL. How cool is that? Next question. Storm the Enemy asks, Ooh. what things could you do if you could generate and control electrons? Um, all of life is just the movement of electrons from one place to another. Whether that be uh, chemical reactions happening, whether that be electricity, whether that be um, atoms repelling each other, attracting each other, exchanging electrons between them. If you could fully control a, f a, a fundamental particle of matter like that, um, you'd be the most powerful thing in existence. You could control literally everything, except for dark matter. We have no idea what that is. What's next? It's most of the universe as well. No, that's dark energy. But a lot of the universe is dark matter. I have no idea what it is. When do you nerds figure it out? What's next? Kravlix asks, can a human survive years in ice like Captain America? No. Okay, sure, I'll go into more detail about it. Um, the, the problem with being frozen and then being reanimated is that without the proper, I mean, in the movies, we'll just skim over this, and that's, that's fine, that's fine, narratively speaking. But if you just freeze someone, and their brain stops, and their heart stops, and their metabolism, which is just the summation of the chemistry of them, if that all ceases, they are dead. That's it. But what you can do is do what, I answered this like two weeks ago as well, but there's a, there's a frog, for example, that kind of produces antifreeze-like chemicals in its blood so that it never truly freezes all the way through. And it doesn't develop freezer burn, which is when ice crystals form inside of cells and burst them, which would be another reason why you would die if you're fully frozen through. So Captain America, if he wanted to survive being frozen, he would have to have some kind of technology like this little frog uses by uh, suffusing his body with a kind of antifreeze. Um, and so he's never truly frozen. He's more like chilled, like the winter soldier. Oh! What's next? The Spectre. <laughs> The Ridiculous. Spectre says, uh, Ari, the super speed stuff, yeah. with the passing of time and the difference between traveling at slash near light speed versus friends in normal time, affect the speedster and his friends would grow old and die much, much sooner? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the closer you get to the speed of light, the more you, uh, uh, relativistically speaking, there is a factor called gamma. Uh, that determines how much time contracts for you, relatively speaking, how much mass, relativistically speaking, again, how much mass you gain and how much your length contracts. Time, space, uh, and mass all change according to this factor, Lorenz factor here, uh, gamma. So the closer you get to the speed of light, the bigger this gets, which means that if you are running at the speed of light uh, or close to the speed of light, Let's, let's make this 100, let's make this, uh, this factor 100. So then if you 
run for one second at that speed to get this factor, you will experience one second to you. You look at your clock, one second. When you stopped running, 100 seconds would have passed for everyone else. So you can see, at some ludicrous speed, you could run, you could try to save the day over the course of a minute, let's say, but when you stop, 40 years have passed and everyone you know is dead. I mean, not everyone, if you know any babies. <laughs> but yeah, uh, relativity, if you don't have something like the speed force to save you, which I don't know what that is, but if you don't, if you don't have a way around relativity, traveling at relativistic speeds can be very, very dangerous. Although you can use it in really cool sci-fi ways. One of my favorite ways is in Ender's Game, the first book, where uh, to preserve a really, uh, to preserve someone for an upcoming war, they put him in a ship and start uh, moving him at relativistic speeds. Because they know the war is going to happen because of the distances they have to travel. The war is going to happen like 40 or 50 years from now. But they don't want this guy to die. So they put him in a ship and move him relativistically so that when he's done moving, He's only experienced, you know, a year, but 50 years has passed when he comes out. That's so cool. I mean, I, when I do all of this stuff, the point that I always like to come back to is that, yes, some of this can be shown to be, oh, that wouldn't really work, but there is always a really cool way to, sh to incorporate the science and make it narratively interesting, just like Ender's Game or like The Expanse does. You do it right, it can be just as good as anything else, because sci, you, you know. Do you got time for one more? Yeah. Short one now. Short one. Jimmy Durr asked, A. a school physics teacher told us that the universe was infinite, and then the next day he told us that it was expanding. Which is it? It's expanding into itself in an accelerating fashion. It's, uh, okay, so I don't know the, the, the current thinking of astrophysicists and cosmologists, but my understanding is, uh, it, the, basically speaking, it's 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 weird. It's kind of a, it's kind of a semantics thing. Space, the if space had an edge, what would be beyond it? If space is everything, is nothing beyond it? And if space is accelerating and expanding, isn't it accelerating into nothing? But it's still everything. <sighs> Depends on how semantic uh, you want to get about it, but I think there's interpretations for a lot of uh, different kinds of the, the use of the terms infinite or not. So thank you. Thank you. That was another edition of Because Science Live. Thank you so much for your nerdy questions. If you want to ask me more questions, uh, next week we have another live stream, or you can go to the last episode of Because Science and an upcoming episode, epi all the episodes, all the main episodes of Because Science, and leave your comments, questions, and corrections at facebook.com slash because science, youtube.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Those are the places I look to do the vlogs where I take all of your questions just like this, just in a slightly longer format. And before I go, uh, thank you so much for getting us to 300,000 subscribers in just two months. That is so awesome, and it, it really makes me feel good because uh, trying to become smarter with all of you is literally what I do all day, and it's my life's work, and uh, it feels good to know that we're building this little community of ours. And one last thing, you might get a little, you know, you know, we, we're doing some pretty cool things. 300,000K? Nope, that's 3 million. 300,000 subscribers? Pretty good. So you might get something special from me, video-wise, on Monday. Stay tuned. Be nice to each other.